Hello, um, good morning, afternoon, or evening, whatever time you are watching this. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and we're just going to jump right into our information. Just a second while I get there. All right. So this week I did uh, the reading called The Life of Constantine by Eusebius. It is made up of uh, four sections or four books um, with chapters within each of them. Um, and the chapters are, are probably similar to chapters that you're aware of where they're small chunks. Um, so I'm just going to go over the information and the analysis of all of this information about the life of Constantine. This, he's a pretty huge historical figure, um, let alone a church historical figure. Um, so let's get started because we have a lot of information to go over and I'm going to try to keep it um, under 20 minutes. So I have a few quotes here um, from the reading itself. Um, most of it is Eusebius or it is a prayer from Constantine. By virtue of this salutary sign, which I have preserved and liberated your city from the yoke of tyranny, I have also set at liberty the Roman Senate and people and restored them to their ancient distinction and splendor. This is on a statue that Constantine, or I should say it was on um, a statue that Constantine did of himself in Rome, and he was holding a cross when he liberated uh, the Rome. Roman city and, and the Italian peninsula. So book one was 56 chapters. Um, and it really goes over a lot of Constantine's character and how it was developed or just um, how it became, how he became who he was. So Eusebius describes Constantine as a pious man, an example of godliness, who loves God. He's a slayer of giants, which pretty much means that he, he killed barbarians, which means he killed Germans is pretty much what that means. Um, and he was worshipful, he was generous, and he was wise, all which were really good things, even the slayer of giants back then. Um, Eusebius compared Constantine uh, to historical figures that are well known, such as Moses, Cyrus the Great, and Alexander the Great. Um, Cyrus the Great, pictured here in kind of the tannish photo, um, was a ruler of the Persian Empire. Um, and he's considered great because he ruled with toleration um, and that he had a very va uh, vast empire. And so we consider him the great. He has the great title. Um, Cyrus the Great, as perceived by Eusebius, was less than Constantine. Constantine was greater than Cyrus. Because, well, Cyrus, when he died, he got killed by a woman. So, of course, he must automatically be less than Constantine. Um, he also, wor uh, Cyrus worshipped pagan gods. So, of course, Constantine must be better. Uh, Alexander the Great, as perceived by Eusebius, was less than Constantine due to Alexander's selfishness, his drunk life, um, and inability to live past the age of 32, which according to Eusebius was due to the fact that Alex was lazy and had indulgent living with um, drinking and stuff like that. Constantine lived a better and more honoring life than that of Alex, according to Eusebius. Now, when Eusebius claims that Constantine's like Moses, it's actually a compliment for Constantine not a criticism of Moses. Um, so Moses, of course, a patriarch of the faith, um, is compared to Constantine by Eusebius in two main ways. He states that since Constantine grew up in a royal household, he's kind of like Moses because he also grew up in a royal household, but they both had to figure out what their plans of life were going to be according to God. So they had to rely on on that, even though they had a privileged upbringing. Another example of him being compared to Moses uh, was one, some of Constantine's enemies, such as Maxentius and Lucinius, which we'll go over a little bit later. Um, they also had hardened hearts like Pharaoh. And so 
um, they he compares those bad guy characters in Constantine's life um, as Moses would be compared to Pharaoh, as Pharaoh's were, was the bad guy for Moses. So there's a few things. Book one continued. Constantius, Constantine's father. So Constantine's father, um, he had kind of a here and there life, um, and he was uh, eventually he received the title of Augustus, which means that he was the ruler of all of the Roman Empire, or at least I should say at this time a portion of the Roman Empire, because um, Diocletian. Uh, before them had split the empire in half, Diocletian ruled the eastern, more wealthy eastern half, and he gave um, Maximian uh, the other half, um, which was the west portion. Um, and so we we had split the empire in half. So when Constantius becomes uh, in power, it's still split in half. It's not recombined until Constantine combines it again through his conquering. Um, so just a little bit of context of where Constantius is at. Um, so Eusebius spends a while talking about Constantius um, because Constantius is not like Diocletian. He's not like Maximian. He's not like the other emperors of Rome at all because he does not persecute the Christians. He does not martyr them either at a time when that was actually very common for emperors to do. He had at, at one point lost a lot of wealth. He touched base with a lot of his friends, hoping that they would help him out financially. And they did um, because he was an honorable man. After he recouped his wealth and got back into power, he gave that money back to those people who helped him out. Constantius told his soldiers at one time. So this was one of those really like interesting stories that show um, a little bit of truth, but Constantius told his soldiers that they had to worship a demon that he told them to worship. And if they didn't, they lost their jobs. And so those that compromised and said, oh yes, I will worship this demon, show me the way. Uh, he actually fired those people, but the people who stood by their beliefs and said, I'm sorry, no, I'm not doing that. Um, he actually let them keep their job because he wanted people who were loyal, no matter what, not the people who would be swayed based off of pressure. And so he uh, had some wisdom there uh, with some of the people who he kept in a job. He, his household had many servants who were uh, Christian and um, they believe that Constantius what, did become a Christian. Uh, at the end of his life, Constantine got the inheritance of his Augustus title. Um, and therefore Constantine had a very um, good start to uh, his rule. So very quickly into his rule, Constantine had a vision. This is a well-known story where he and his soldiers, it wasn't just him, but he and his soldiers had a vision of the cross in the sky. And it and with the insignia or the inscription, sorry, of conquer by this. So Constantine had a cross um, as viewed in this picture um, with a the P or the Rho and the um, X, I'm forgetting the Greek name of that letter right now, but it's uh, representing the name Christ or Christos in Greek. Um, and they put this metal thing, huge metal thing um, in battle and they believed that it was God's presence winning them battles. And that was God using them to win all these battles for his glory, for God's glory. Um, and they put it in all of the armies and they carried it and they had like 50 guards on it at all times to protect it from falling. Um, so it was an important part of Constantine's reliance on God, he believed, and it also helped him conquer a lot of land. Constantine has two main foes that uh, Eusebius speaks about. And it's a little bit between book one and book two that uh, we they're talked about. So we have Maxentius um, and we have Lucinius. So Eusebius spans book one and two as mentioned as already these very vile and evil men. He describes them as following magic, which requires some horrific, ugh, gross things um, such as in, 
um, disemboweling babies, um, many of them at once, um, and other really awful pagan type worshiping of gods that requires sacrifice. Um, and so he paints them in a light that is extremely dim. Now, do I know if these things actually happened and that they were actually doing it? No, Eusebius has a little bit of a love story going on with Constantine. When you read the this uh, primary source, you see that from the very beginning, Eusebius is just saying, oh, Constantine, he's so great. So it is possible that yes, these were bad guys, maybe not as bad as Eusebius is describing them. He wanted Constantine to be painted in a light that showed that he was awesome, which means he was going to be killing the baby murderers. And so that's probably why it was included. Is it possible Maxentius could have still been doing that? Yes. I don't know. I don't know what their pagan worship was like exactly. I'm not a scholar on that, but um, just keep that as a grain of salt as we're talking about these bad guys. Um, Maxentius and Licinius both lived a very sensual life according to Eusebius, um, Maxentius is documented by him to have sent some of his senators away and while, um, and pretty much said, you gotta go. If you don't, I'm gonna kill you. So they left. Um, and when they left, he showed up at their house and raped their wives. So Eusebius's uh, account of this um, also tells a story of a Christian woman who was in that circumstance with Maxentius. And instead of allowing him to reach her, she ended up falling on a sword and killing herself. And Eusebius actually glorifies that woman because she's upholding Christian morals um, and therefore not letting a man that's not her husband touch her, um, which I don't necessarily like the idea that she had to kill herself in order to maintain that, but that was something that he honored. Uh, Lucinius is another bad guy, um, and Constantine has victory over both of these people, um, which he attributes to God doing his work through him on earth, um, allowing Constantine to defeat these evil men. So that's pretty much the end of book one. Before we get into book two, um, this is just a prayer that Constantine has. Um, in regards to some disagreements that are at the end of book two. Um, I'm not gonna read through that. If you'd like to pause it and read it, you're welcome to. Book two, Constantine makes the empire Christian is kind of the main theme of book two. There are 73 chapters in book two. So um, he also explains a lot of uh, military victories, uh, a lot of military victories over many enemies of Constantine. Um, and so he, at that point, he just controls a lot of land and because he controls a lot of land. He has a lot of power and a lot of the Christians had been persecuted under Mac Maxentius and Licinius. And so we have a lot of issues going on with, um, people not having the property they had before, or their house were burnt down or bishops had been killed. And so the church was in disrepair and stuff like that. So Constantine endeavors to fix as much that is fixable. So he gives land back to who it needs to be given back to. Uh, he makes decrees that encourage um, Christian practices and not pagan practices. Um, and he really tries to change the area of land that he has conquered um, towards Christianity, towards the church. Um, he starts building the Roman churches um, that we know of today. Um, and he pretty much starts to say, hey, idolatry is bad. Don't do it. Um, eventually he makes decrees about how that's not going to happen anymore. But at this point, he's just kind of touching base on it, um, so that it's not shocking when it happens. But Eusebius ends this book, um, as I mentioned right before I started this book, um, with, talking about a, an issue that's going on in Africa um, between some bishops. And I'm not gonna get into the details of, of that problem, but yeah, it's a problem. I'm gonna read this because this shows a little bit of Eusebius's appreciation 
uh, for Constantine. So in book three that we're going about to get into, uh, it talks a lot about the Council of Nicaea. So uh, this is his account, Eusebius's account of Constantine uh, walking into the Council of Nicaea. He says, like some heavenly messenger of God, Constantine was clothed in raiment, which glittered as it were with toys of light, rays of light, reflecting the flowing and brilliant splendor of gold and precious stones. Such was the external appearance of his person. And with regard to his mind, it was evident that he was distinguished by piety and godly fear. This was indicated by his down gait. For the rest of his personal excellencies, he surpassed all present in height and stature and beauty form, as well as in majestic dignity of mind and invincible strength and vigor. That is how he talks about him like all the time. Like, we'll get into that a little bit more later, but like, he's just constantly praising Constantine, praising how Constantine didn't praise himself, but praised God. He's like, wow, what a pious, anyway, it's a little, that's a little much. Um, so you'll recognize this picture as the picture of our class um, on our, on Populi. This is the section. Um, so this is this guy right here. That's what he looked like in his splendor and his strength, uh, according to Eusebius. Um, but that's Constantine right there. So book three, Constantine calls the Council of Nicaea and a bunch of other stuff, but that's the main idea of book three. Eusebius painted a very interesting and in-depth description of the Council of Nicaea. He describes the room full of bishops from all over the known world, from Spain to Persia and everywhere in between. Um, Eusebius describes that room full of opinions, but all united in order to unite in the end. Um, as Constantine told them, hey, I want you to be united. This is the point. Um, one of the main reasons uh, to call this council was to determine the date of Easter um, and many other issues, of course, but Eusebius does not go into the grave details of what was talked about, just that um, uniting all these bishops together was the intention and was in fact succeeded because Constantine's awesome was pretty much his claim. So the decision to date Easter was made apart from the Jewish traditional calendar. Um, and Constantine, Constantine speaks at length about this. He says that the Jews needed to be separated from the Christian Easter as they are misguided, choosing to be blinded that they would kill Jesus. So in all ways, separate Easter from the Jewish calendar. Constantine writes the bishop across the empire, bishops across the empire, that were not at the council um, about the decision of, of the dating of Easter. And since there were so many bishops there, it attested to that it was the will of God to make that decision, according to Constantine. Book three continued. Um, later in book three, it talks a lot about the churches he built. Uh, some of them specifically, and some of them just generally, he builds churches all over the empire. He rebuilds some that were just in disrepair or had been burnt down from persecutions. Uh, Rome is a popular place where he built many of them. Um, Constantinople, which used to be, is, is now Istanbul, but used to be Byzantium, um, but is now Constantinople, also has churches built in it. Um, and um, he sends his mom, Helena, to Palestine or um, Israel area uh, to figure out some stuff with relics, but also to build churches. So um, she was in charge of a few churches uh, in that area. Um, we get the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, um, which is believed to be the location of Jesus' tomb. And some other traditions, not according to the life of Constantine, um, they also believe it's where um, Jesus' cross may be. Um, or where he was crucified, but it depends on the tradition that you're looking into. Uh, but according to Eusebius, this is the place of his tomb. Um, we also have the Church of the Nativ Nativity in Bethlehem. Um, these are modern pictures. This is not necessarily what they looked like. They have been rebuilt time and time again because of various uh, wars and um, time. 
So, but there are many parts that are likely original um, to the fourth century build. I'm also going to read this, but we're going to come back to it in just a moment, see how much time we have left. So book four, Constantine's great emperor. That's pretty much what he spends all of book four doing. Um, but Eusebius continues with the accolades of Constantine. Um, Constantine shares his thoughts on prayer um, and his attitude towards Sunday and how it needs to be a day of prayer, not only for Christians, but he emphasizes for pagans as well. Um, he also has a, a long conversation with the ruler of Persia about the peace that he's brought to Rome and how there are Christian bishops in Persia um, that the ruler of Persia is in charge of and how they have united with those in Rome as well and what that means for Persia. So they talk about that for a while. He uh, is in conversation with Eusebius himself, over 50 copies of the Bible or of the Holy Scripture, um, as referred to by Eusebius and Constantine. Um, and they work together as to what the plans are to get those 50 copies made. Um, and it accounts his death. Um, and of course, after Eusebius accounts his death, he spends the next 10 chapters talking about how amazing Constantine is. Um, and the last chapter is what I'm going to come back to here. This is just the whole last chapter, chapter 75. I'm going to go ahead and read it. And then we'll get into the analysis. My favorite part. Standing as he did alone and preeminent among the Roman emperors as a worshiper of God, alone as the bold proclaimer to all men of the doctrine of Christ, having alone rendered honor as none before him had ever done to his church, having alone abolished utterly the error of polytheism and discountenanced idolatry in every form, so alone among them, both during life and after death, was he accounted worthy of such honors as none can say have been attained by any other, so that no one, whether Greek or barbarian, nay, of the ancient Romans themselves, have ever been presented to us as worthy of a comparison with him. Quite the man, huh, Eusebius? All right, analysis, let's get into this. Was Constantine a great emperor? Eusebius knew Constantine personally. He wrote this biography, and as good historians, we need to take what he said as biased. D.H. Williams, the author of the book that we just wrote our report on, this guy. In this book, he says, to say that Eusebius's influential life of Constantine speaks for the general aspirations of the church or of the church's actual relations with Constantine must be squared with the fact that the work is an unabashed panegyric celebration in every way the praises of the truly blessed prince. The picture that emerges here may be confidently said to represent the writer's own ideal and the new Christian empire and only approximates historical actualities. This is on page 140 of this book. Can we believe the words of Eusebius? The answer is yes and no. Yes, we can believe the ed edicts and the facts of the events that are checked with other hist histories of the time. But I will say to me, Eusebius, Eusebius nauseatingly goes on about how amazing Constantine truly is, how he's blessed in every turn. The very masculinity of Constantine is considered a gift from God to spread God's kingdom by Eusebius. To me, after reading 80-ish pages of Eusebius's proclaiming the pious, benevolent, generous emperor Constantine, remember, slayer of giants, I consider Eusebius equating Constantine with Jesus himself, or at least as close as you possibly can get. Like that's how much he honors Constantine. Not, not in a healthy honor way, but like way above. Just, I will say my take and perhaps this guy's take as well, but okay. 
Uh, Eusebius does not, as he stated uh, near the beginning of book one, uh, intend to proclaim his military victories and his actions of state. So Eusebius does, he wanted to proclaim his spiritual life um, in his biography, which at times includes military victories and matters of state. Um, I think this is where we miss out on some of Constantine's humanness um, and um, imperfections um, as Eusebius chooses not to include them because he doesn't think that they attribute to his spiritual life. And so therefore I feel like that kind of causes it to be one-sided. In book three, Eusebius accounts the decision to date Easter uh, as we still date it today, apart from the Jewish calendar. Now, this is something that you might need some context with. Um, Jesus died um, on Passover, um, when the Passover lamb gets slain in the temple. It, co it coincides with the Jewish calendar and the events of Passover. Like Jesus gave up his last breath the moment that the last lamb was slain in the temple. Um, and it is a, a direct picture that was extremely intentional on God's part to have. And so we can, according to the Jewish calendar, date Easter accurately. However, Constantine doesn't want that. And many bishops didn't want that. It's not just Constantine. I particularly like the picture because I think it's important to understand the full picture of all of the Jewish calendar um, events in light of um, who Jesus is and how it was intentional on God's part to have the festivals to be a picture of Jesus. Um, but Constantine doesn't want it. He doesn't want anything to do with the Jewish people. I would consider him anti-Semitic. Um, and because he sends out this edict to the entirety of Christendom, he says this, since therefore it was needful that this matter should be rectified so that we might have nothing in common with the nation of parasites who slew their Lord. This is not the only time he speaks ill of Jews. And I would say because the, the statement was respected because it came from Constantine that it probably promoted more anti-Semitism. And there are a ton of evidence of anti-Semitism from this point on. And so I would say one of the major flaws of Constantine is his anti-Semitism and his influence on the rest of history. We'll leave that there. So what do we do with Constantine? Constantine had many good things going for him. He united the church. That's super important. Um, he united the church for the next 700 years before the Greek Orthodox uh, separates from the Catholic church. Um, and he was used by God. Maybe not as much as Eusebius mentions, but God uses him uh, definitely to unite the church. And in some of the prayers within um, Eusebius's work that he accounts of Constantine, Constantine understood the gospel. He understood uh, who Jesus was and the need for a savior of sin. Um, in the secular area of history, Constantine is kind of always looked at negatively as pretty much the ruiner of the modern world. I wouldn't say or go as far as that, but there's an interesting documentary if you're interested in that view. Um, and it's also a book. It was a book also turned into a documentary um, called Constantine's Sword. Um, I had a undergrad English professor have us watch and read the book. Um, and it's an interesting one. I don't agree with everything or the whole premise of the thesis of all of that. But if you're interested in a secular perspective of Constantine, that would be one of them, Constantine's sword. So how can we be, uh, res how can we respect one side over the other? I mean, where's the middle ground? So as with many things in history, it's up to us to do our own research and filter through the bias and sift through it, which I will say with Constantine, there's so much bias out there with him. 
one way or the other. My take is that he is both a man that God used, and he had a clear understanding of the gospel, according to Eusebius's uh, prayers that he documents of him. Constantine was also a human in a secular role as emperor, and he had many missteps. He's not perfect, and he's not a perfect person. It's important to know he's not a perfect person, Eusebius, because he also needs a savior, just as we do, and that is Jesus. So find the nuggets of valor that you want to find in him. I think those nuggets include the unity of the church, the hope in prayer that he emphasizes, a peaceful countenance bearing each other's burdens as he does at the council of, or as Eusebius accounts him doing at the council of Nicaea and throw away the useless stuff like anti-Semitism and perhaps some of his waging war on God's behalf. Um, so that's my take um, on the life of Constantine by Eusebius. Um, I would say if you want to read any of it, which do you have time? But if you do um, at any point, I would read book three because that's the Council of Nicaea and book one. Um, two and four are good, but I would start with book three and then go to book one and then go from there if you want to read more. But I liked, I liked book three the most because the Council of Nicaea account was actually quite entertaining and I thought very good. So, um, let's see. And thank you for listening. I hope you have a great rest of your day. And I'm going to stop recording now.